All right, I think we are getting up towards uh, everybody being on here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, for those of you who are regulars, you know you've got your sys tray, the webinar presentation is there ready to go. For those of you who might be new to the ON24 platform, you're going to see a little tray with um, some downloadable content in there. Sometimes we load it up with other things, like if we have a new like cybersecurity survey or something other interesting like that some freebies that you might uh, you know, want to grab. Um, there is uh, the presentation though, everything we're gonna go through, especially if you wanna grab some of the links or other things. I know many of you go straight into your change control process from this meeting. So grab that download quick before you forget about it. That way you don't have to wait for that to be uh, posted later in the follow-up emails that will come out. All right. We have a great lineup of uh, news articles for you. There's a, a lot of uh, recent cybersecurity news that you'll definitely want to just be apprised of, um, some relating to the Microsoft updates, some broader industry level, just to be aware of. We're going to go through a bit of a uh, deeper dive into a couple of those vulnerabilities, the ones that are actively being exploited, especially. And the bulletins and releases. Todd's going to walk us through all of those. Apparently, we missed a 2023 in there somewhere, Todd. Apparently, uh -oh. it said 20, February 14th, 2023 yet. So we're, we're, we're a, year, a year too late on this one, apparently. Uh -oh. We'll have to catch that. Thank you for okay. catching that one. And then uh, we're going to wrap it up with what we refer to as between the patch Tuesdays. Microsoft may have a continuous kind of schedule on that, but many of the vendors, uh, like a, a once a month type schedule is what Microsoft sticks to. Adobe tends to do similar. Um, some vendors do like a quarterly, like Oracle tends to do quarterly releases. Most vendors though, are in a continuous release cycle. So they're gonna release as soon as their updates are ready to go. Google Chrome releases so frequently now, they've just, as of August last year, they basically said every week expect a Google Chrome update. That way organizations can try to align with and prioritize accordingly. Uh, so that's an interesting way of looking at it. We've actually seen a number of of you, our customers, and uh, uh, how you are responding to that type of shift. So many organizations are starting to contemplate or are even already adopting a release schedule of once a month maintenance and a parallel release track that some are referring to as priority updates. Todd and I tend to agree with that kind of uh, um, label on that one, because basically what you're doing is you're setting up a continuous release track that doesn't require an out of band heavy uh, process with specific criteria, like maybe it's browsers and uh, you know zero days are the only things that can get into that window without additional exceptions being made. Um, whatever the case may be, getting that parallel track to make it so you can drive kind of continuous updates to your um, user base, especially server infrastructure, a little bit different. You typically try to tend to get those only once a month or as needed. Um, but for the user base, especially, we're seeing a lot more organizations create that parallel update track for priority updates on a more frequent basis, typically weekly, sometimes multiple windows, windows per week. Uh, but that's, that's where we talk about that between the patch Tuesdays Here's all of the other things that came out since the January Patch Tuesday, Chrome releases, other applications, many of which have security vulnerabilities in them, things that you'll want to just put on your radar and make sure that you're addressing as well during your maintenance this month. Um, and of course, we're going to do some Q&A. So for those of you who are familiar already, you've got the Q&A window up there. We've got uh, Jenna, who supports our, our uh, call here each month. And then we've also got a couple of our product and content experts, Long and Richard are on there as well. They help respond to a lot of questions as we go through. So do go ahead and, um, you know, let us know if you're, uh, if you have any questions about that and we'll try to answer as many as possible, either directly through chat or live during the call. All right, high level. Now, you don't see Google Chrome on here. By the time Todd and I wrapped up our initial analysis, the Google Chrome update that released yesterday hadn't dropped yet. So you do see Adobe and Microsoft. Um, you know, many of the Adobe actually had six products that released. 
one of which is in our catalog. The other ones are um, the larger kind of uh, production suite applications and middleware that they have um, that uh, you know typically don't get addressed as frequently. Uh, but the Adobe Acrobat and Reader is the one that we're talking about there that we want to make sure is on people's radar. So Google Chrome as well, uh, but we also have several Chrome updates that we'll talk about in that Between the Patch Tuesdays update as well. And then there's a few other things that we'll talk about here, some other uh, releases where if you haven't taken a look, you might want to go back and look at some of the reissues that Microsoft has done to make sure that you've covered some of the content that they have reissued because there are threat actor activities around that, specifically the Windows AppX installer, that one in particular um, originally came out in 2021. Microsoft actually had a, a reissue of informational update um, in December this last year because of heightened threat actor activity. And they're reissuing again to kind of clarify some of the, the steps in that as well to uh, bring attention back to it because there's still kind of continued uh, abuse of that uh, Apex installer uh, by threat actors. So a few things there to, to kind of keep an eye on um, that aren't strictly, you know, patches that need to be updated this month. All right, so this next uh, bit here, I'm going to actually shift from the slides over to, I'm gonna share my screen out. So for those of you who haven't uh, seen this before, you're about to see another window pop up within your On24 browser experience. With that, you can, um, go ahead and uh, resize those windows if you don't have space to, to look at that. Otherwise, if you've got space, you can even extend this out onto both screens if you've got two and have the slides on one and the uh, shared screen on the other. But I'm just gonna go through some of these articles and identify some of the key highlights there. The first one here is an article that was specifically about the Microsoft Security Feature Bypass Zero Day uh, vulnerabilities, uh, particularly some cyber attacks from the Water Hydra um, threat actor group. They are targeting this vulnerability. This kind of goes in and talks about Patch Tuesday in general, but then it gets into some specifics about that Water Hydra, uh, uh, AKA Dark Casino, if you know it more by that name, the vulnerabilities that they're targeting and uh, the other one, the smart screen vulnerability using uh, Dark Me is using that one right now. So this is just getting into uh, kind of giving you more ammo for making sure that you're getting the right priority and uh, um, drive around getting these rolled out this month. Spoiler alert, bottom line this month, the OS update is your most important thing you can do on the Windows side. Uh, this is going to take the majority of the risk out of uh, uh, most of what is going on out there. There's a few other things we will talk about that are also a concern, but not actively being exploited right now. So these are the two vulnerabilities and the different threat actor groups that are targeting them right now. Again, kind of fuel for any prioritization efforts you need to do to try to push things through quickly and effectively. Another one that kind of went a little bit broader. So the first one focused on the Water Hydra and uh, Dark Me. Um, the next one here expands to talk about a couple of the other updates this month that you also want to take uh, a little bit of attention around. For those of you who are still running Microsoft Exchange Server, uh, Brian Krebs does go into a little bit of detail here. He had some uh, feedback from some of the uh, industry uh, analysts and vendors that talks about some of the concerns with this. The vulnerability on Exchange Server is one where if you're up to the latest CUs for whichever version of Exchange Server you may still be running, <clears throat> this new feature is turned on by, or this feature is turned on by default, but the, uh, let's see, yeah, here he calls it out here, extended protection for authentication. After a certain CU level, in the case of 2019, it's cumulative update 14, that's turned on by default. If you're running a CU level prior to that, you need to go and turn this on. That is the number one priority is, are you at the right CU level where that's on by default? Or if you're not, have you turned this feature on? If you did, much of the risk of this vulnerability is mitigated. It's not eliminated, but it's mitigated to reduce the possibility of this being abused. Now, that doesn't mean you don't push the exchange update. You should get this into your regular um, 
uh, test cycles because this one is particularly nasty. It's an elevation of privilege, but one that also could allow the attacker to gain access to NTLM hashes. For that local system that's compromised, they could then scrape a bunch of identities off of um, credential uh, information to be able to use elsewhere. So this is a perfect kind of scenario for the attacker to elevate privileges and also to grab some identities to start fueling their lateral movement throughout your environment. So number one priority for exchange users, make sure you're at the right CU level, that that extended protection is turned on by default. If you're not, go in and make sure that you've turned it on. Microsoft had some extensive uh, information about that within the, the CVE page there. Um, and they've got links to other Exchange server blog uh, information and other things there. That's the number one thing to look for on the Exchange side. The Office update this month. Again, not currently actively being exploited, but Microsoft is concerned and other um, analysts are concerned about this one because it is, again, another nasty kind of perfect vulnerability for threat actors to take advantage of. The Microsoft Office CVE 2024-21413 is a critical, a high CVSS score. It allows the attacker to basically bypass security measures. So the mark of the web um, protected view is not being honored if they craft a, a file the right way. Um, that allows them to bypass that. It can also be um, the Outlook preview pane is an attack vector. So the user doesn't even have to open the email if they, you know, if it gets into their inbox and they scroll past it and it comes up in the preview pane, execute it. It, it can uh, uh, take advantage of that and uh, do whatever it is they've uh, crafted that to do. So remote code execution, um, they could cause a file to open in edit mode, even though the user had not uh, intended to do so. So those are ones where while it's not being actively exploited, definitely you don't want to hold off too long on on you know making sure that you've got Exchange and Office going through uh, their testing paces and make sure that they get rolled out in a reasonable time frame. Uh, the next one here again just kind of gives a slightly different variation on some of some of the perspectives here. So more fuel for the fire if you need the right information to bring to other parts of your organization to drive remediation activities. So just trying to give you some of the information you need to help there. Um, one of the things that they touch on too in theirs was the DNSSEC vulnerabilities. So this is a part of the Windows OS update this month. Um, it has a bit more of a far reaching kind of uh, potential impact, which I've included another article here. Um, now, this is a news article. There's more knowledge type articles that get into more of the, you know, the gory details of what exactly is going on. Uh, this is kind of outlining the, the danger of this particular vulnerability. Uh, what researchers and uh, uh, the Center for Applied Cybersecurity are calling the worst attack on DNS ever discovered, um, you know, the potential risks of this one are real. Um, it could uh, be a very painful impact if somebody were to try to start attacking this one on a broad scale. Um, so details about that in here, again, for the Windows side, uh, Microsoft identified it as a third party CVE that they were talking about. It's because they're using DNSSEC uh, in Windows DNS and they have a, an update that they have to provide to be able to resolve that vulnerability. Um, so those are the additional um, things that you want to be aware of there. Um, in other news, a couple other things that uh, were interesting out there. This one in particular, um, there's been a lot of speculation about deep fakes, um, generative AI being used to uh, drive more and more sophisticated scams. Well, we've got the, the uh, biggest example yet of this in real life. So a deep faked, um, video conference convinced an employee to basically give up $25 million across multiple accounts um, because they thought they were being asked to do this by their, uh, their own employees, their leadership. Uh, so it talks about uh, this particular one. I, I thought this article from CPO Magazine did a good job of talking about the feasibility of 
and uh, I believe this one, yep, uh, be, it talks about the possibility of AI enhanced fraud becoming more and more effective by the day, uh, not possibility of the actual occurrence of. So it's a good read. It goes into a lot of detail and uh, talks about um, you know the impacts and what you know people should be thinking about. Um, but that was a uh, if you haven't seen that one yet, uh, it's definitely one to be aware of because it's going to be more and more prevalent. Chip makers also had a number of updates. So there could be there could be some things here with um, AMD and Intel um, mm-hmm. updates going through. Now, this is always kind of a, a tangled web of once the, the chip vendors release their updates, then all of the OEMs have to take it in on their side and you know do their updates and uh, all the different layers that it has to go through. Um, so this is more of a on the horizon expect that you know there's going to be some uh, chipset updates and other things coming here. The writer here goes into a number of different uh, uh, vulnerabilities that were resolved between the different vendors. Um, so just kind of a, if you want to read more into it, uh, there's some details in there about that, but it's more of an awareness of there will be some, you know, uh, there's some necessity to keep updating drivers and uh, uh, firmware within your organization. For those of you on the Linux side, this last one here is, I'm not gonna get into the the sides of this conflict, but the kernel is now becoming its own CNA. Um, So CVE numbering authority, this means that they're basically going to be a gatekeeper for any CVEs that are opened against the kernel. Um, There's a lot of controversy in these threads. I'm putting it in here more as a expect that there's um, some changes with how CVEs for Linux kernel are going to be uh, treated in the future here. Some doomsayers are saying it's going to be the worst thing ever. Some others are saying, hey, it's actually going to put some uh, clarity around things so somebody can't just go in, scrape uh, some random password uh, reference and say, CVE, do this. Um, You know, there's a lot of uh, good and bad in the discussions there, um, I think. Overall, it's a sign of this part of the uh, Linux world trying to mature itself. You can see that many of the big vendors in other areas have become their own CNA as well. Microsoft, Google, a number of them are. There's uh, good and bad to each of those things, um, but just a, more of an awareness that this is happening there. If you haven't heard about it, it may be something that if you're heavily in the Linux world, that could be something that you want to keep keep track of. All right, so we are going to move into the two new uh, exploited vulnerabilities this month. So out of the 73 net new vulnerabilities, two of them were zero days on the Microsoft side. Um, the first one is the Windows Smart Screen Security Feature Bypass. 7.6 CVSS score. Um, only rated as important, or no, this was the one that was rated by mo- as moderate by Microsoft. Um, throw all that out. This is actively being exploited. I gave you several articles uh, before talking about threat actors who are actively using this vulnerability today in campaigns. These are static assessments and not relevant to the real world risk. So in a risk-based perspective, this is a critical vulnerability you want to get this rolled out in a timely fashion and and make sure to close this gap quickly because there are active campaigns currently being executed against this. Um, So security feature bypass and smart screen, what this allows the attacker to do is bypass the mark of the web uh, feature within uh, the smart screen. So as you download something, if it comes from the internet, it gets a specific zone identifier and when it tries to be opened, it's going to be interrogated to look for things like it's gonna do reputation checks and it's going to pop up in a protected view or you know different things like that. All of those kind of go aside if the attacker is able to bypass that and uh, work around that identi- zone identifier. So with that, the attacker can convince a user to open a specially crafted file. They say it like it's a, a difficult thing or not gonna be something that the attacker will be a- able to achieve. In reality, I think we all know it's a statistical challenge, not an actual difficulty. If I get enough people in my campaign, I will absolutely get several of them to open what I want. 
We've seen generative AI making it even easier for things to be crafted and tailored to the target that is going to receive that. So more and more phishing of this type is becoming easier once again for the attackers. If they successfully exploit this, the vulnerability could bypass the smart screen user experience. The vulnerability allows a, an attacker to inject code into smart screen and potentially gain code execution, which could then lead to some data exposure, lack of system availability, or both. Um, so again, actively being used in the wild. Um, this is confirmed exploited, so it's not academic at this point. It's real. Um, it is in uh, basically all currently supported versions of the OS. Guarantee that it's probably in many unsupported versions of the OS as well, but if you're still running those, you know that you're not going to get the security updates there, but this threat is still potentially very real for those systems. Um, so that is the update for the first one. Second one is the internet shortcut files security feature bypass. Uh, that's the theme this month, security feature bypass. Um, the severity on this is important. The CBSS score, 8.1. The, uh, let's see here, going down. Again, exploit has already been detected in the wild and there's uh, specific threat actors have campaigns around this um, that, you know, basically, again, there it's not a if, it's a when at this point. Uh, an attacker must send the user a malicious file to convince them to open it. Again, statistical challenge, not hard to do. If they do that, they could send the user a targeted, uh, targeted user a specially crafted file that's designed to bypass displayed security checks. However, they would have no way to force the user to view an attacker controlled bit of content. So they have to convince them to do so. Again, it's just a phishing challenge at that point. They, they will get in with enough attempts. Um, so both features, uh, scrolling down to the affected, again, Windows OS is where this one is resolved again this month. Uh, so those on top of the criticals that were in the OS update this month, basically uh, this is your number one priority. Uh, we've also talked about the office update with a particularly nasty uh, vulnerability that can uh, take advantage of the preview pane. Um, so that would definitely be one that I would urge you to also try to get out as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, this is your top priority this month is the OS update. Okay. Going off of the screen share and back over to just the slides. On the Linux side, once again, there were a couple of other notable things here. Um, this one is a particular vulnerability in um, Red Hat. It's a flaw in Shim. It's an open source bootloader maintained by Red Hat. The vulnerability enables an attacker to craft a specific malicious HTTP request, which could lead to getting a um, you know, completely controlled out of bounds, right? Uh, and basically giving them the ability to compromise the system. So uh, five other vulnerabilities were also affecting Shim that were discovered um, when uh, this all came up. Uh, so they have 2023 CVEs, but with the way the Linux world works, CVEs are identified and it takes a little while to to kind of bubble up through the, the all the different components and get rolled out. Um, so typically there's a little bit more of a lag time on a lot of CVEs getting resolved across different platforms. In this case, this one's probably moving a little bit faster because it's specifically a Red Hat contain or maintained component. One thing for those of you who have been looking at the Linux slides, I actually updated the hyper or the highlighted by Tuxcare. So Tuxcare is our, one of our Linux partners. Uh, they do some interesting things, including um, support for live patching. Um, the Linux world lets us do some things that the Windows world doesn't do today, or Mac for that matter. Um, they have the ability to do this live patching approach, which makes it so you could actually update even the kernel on a Linux system and not have to reboot. Um, so interesting things there if you're more interested, but most important is if you click on that highlighted by Tuxcare, you will actually be taken to Tuxcare's CVE portal where you can actually go in and look up. They, they keep a lot deeper tracking around um, the vulnerabilities and how they're getting rolled out through many different distros. So again, the Linux world being open source, uh, there's a little bit more sprawl once a vulnerability is identified. So if a kernel vulnerability comes out, which distros get it and at what time varies quite a bit at times. Um, 
So that portal gives you a way to go in and research and get deeper into something. So if your security team is worried about a specific CVE, they've got some great ways to go and track more detail around that. Second Linux vulnerability for this month that we're looking at is uh, CVE 2023-6780. It's a glibc vulnerability that affects most distributions um, out there. Um, it's possible to abuse a buffer to trigger um, undefined behavior, which can then elevate privileges on the local system. Um, so they've got a couple of things here where uh, the attacker could call it by syslog or uh, vsyslog. Um, they give you a little bit of detail about that. And there's also some uh, mitigations provided if you get your glibc version to 2.39 or higher to uh, reduce the possibility of exploiting this type of vulnerability. And I think we got one more. Yes, one more on the Linux side, CVE 2024-1086. Use after free vulnerability. It's in the net filter subsystem in the Linux kernel. Uh, so it talks a little bit about uh, the additional context here. If it's in, uh, it enables various networking related operations to be implemented in the form of customized handlers. Uh, so this vulnerability allows uh, the attacker to crash or abuse those handlers to try to be able to use uh, those memory spaces after they're supposed to have been freed up. Mitigation here, you either prevent the affected net filter um, kernel module from being loaded or disable user namespaces. So you've got a couple options there if you need to mitigate that until um, updates are available to resolve those in your environment. All right, a couple of other updates of interest. A lot of this gets into more of the servicing stack updates and the development tools. So if your organization is running any type of DevOps um, organization within your company, releasing internal applications or web, web uh, platforms or something like that, many of these tools may be used within your environment. So this is the list of components on the Azure and development tool side that were updated this month. Um, again, many of you may not be directly responsible for those, but in the broader scope of vulnerability management across your enterprise, these are things that also need to be updated um, to address security vulnerabilities there. Lifecycle wise, we don't have any immediate lifecycle changes coming. So uh, good news for right now, we get a little bit of a reprieve. We've had, uh, you know, the uh, 2012 end of life occurred towards the end of last year. Many of you are continuing with support there. Um, we've engaged with a number of you to uh, enable catalog content for, for that. Um, if you are planning to continue running 2012 for some time and have not done that, again, with the vulnerabilities we talked about there, 2012 was affected by many of those as well. It's definitely a good idea to look into if you're going to continue running it for a period of time. Uh, to make sure you're securing that more. All right. And the long-term service branch as well. This gets a little bit more complicated, so we've broken it out into a separate table here. Um, Chris, we did get a lot of questions last month about that. Yep. Uh, Server 2019 mainstream support ending last month, um, 1-9-2024. And... The reality is that it hasn't gone into ESU, that Microsoft uses the terminology, extended security updates. It's just that they break their support into two, two threads. There's like a five yeah. year and then there's a 10 year. And so they identify mainstream support as you know new features and things like that ending. It doesn't mean yeah. that there are not security updates for the next five years. So it'll still show up as a normal update. Just don't expect any major feature changes or uh, performance enhancements at this point. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Todd, for bringing that up again, just to make sure people are aware. Um, last one here, and then um, I did have one question that I'll address real quick here uh, before we move into the rest. Uh, but if you are using one of the Avanti products, you can go and subscribe to content updates for your particular product's content streams. Uh, so that's the forum page where you can go and sign up for those. Uh, one question that came in, uh, this was actually, this has been addressed in a number of uh, blog posts and advisories and things like that uh, in the previous weeks here. 
Todd talked about it in our forecast last week on HelpNet security, and I mentioned it in the blog yesterday. Uh, but for those of you who are um, running the Avanti, uh, one of the Avanti uh, VPN or Connect Secure products, the updates for those to resolve the vulnerabilities that are being targeted in the wild, uh, they, they are out and available. And the CISA guidance, we've worked very closely with them to uh, get their guidance up to speed as well. I cover all that in the blog from yesterday. If you're interested in that information, there was one person that asked about that. Um, at least I didn't, I'll have to go back and find where it went because there's multiple questions that have come up since. Uh, but if you need information about that, happy to share that with you. Um, we've not hidden anything there. We've tried to give updates as quickly as possible on uh, making sure that people are aware of where we're at in the update process uh, for those products. And uh, the FAQ also covers a broader conversation there. So whether it's concerns about supply chain attacks, things like that, we address all of that in the advisory FAQ uh, on our community. So if you have questions and need that information, please reach out and we will, we will absolutely get you all the information you need there. So, uh, okay. On that note, Todd, go ahead and take us into the bulletins and releases. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Let's talk through what was released yesterday very quickly here. Um, as Chris mentioned, there was a security update for Adobe Acrobat and Reader. Uh, happened early in the day, so we were able to catch it here. We didn't catch the Chrome one later. Um, 13 vulnerabilities in this one, so it's been a fairly major update. Uh, we haven't seen much on this for a couple of months now. Uh, five of the vulnerabilities addressed in these products were rated as critical. So go ahead and take a look at those and make sure, you know, if you're using this in your environment, that you get it updated as quickly as possible. I think most of us use Acrobat these days um, to read things, reader, anyway. Um, moving on to the Windows updates. Uh, Windows 11 update, as usual. Uh, we saw the you know usual support for the 21H2, as well as the 22H2 slash 23H2. Uh, again, the reason those two are lumped together under the same KB article is because they have essentially the same operating system kernel uh, with different features layered on top for the two releases. So that's why they're lumped together as far as the updates go, as a matter of fact. They did address 41 vulnerabilities, so they've been ramping up since the beginning of the year when they started really slow. Um, Chris talked in quite a bit of detail about the uh, two vulnerabilities that I've listed in red here that are known exploited, so I won't go into a lot of details on those. Um, one of the things I was kind of shocked to see is that they reported no known issues across uh, Windows 11. They had been carrying some small things forward for a couple of months, but it looks like they are either not reporting on them anymore or they've resolved them. So um, take a look at those. On the Windows 10 side, a uh, few more vulnerabilities addressed. There were 44 there. As Chris said, the, you know, the key this month is the operating system vulnerabilities because of those two known exploited um, issues. Um, they have lots of versions of Windows 10 out there that are, that are still running, as you can see from the affected products list that I have at the top there. And there are some known issues uh, reported this month. But, um, again, one that's carried forward are these Copilot and Icon Display issues. We saw those last month uh, in this particular release, the Windows 10 uh, edu education and enterprise versions for 21H2 and 22H2. Um, again, I talked about this last month a little bit as well. Uh, Copilot was the new, um, you know, help system that's introduced in Windows 11. It was backported to Windows 10, so they have run into a couple of issues here and there uh, in Windows. Uh, for example, there is an issue where, depending on how you have your taskbar oriented, it doesn't work properly. And again, there is another issue with icons uh, moving around, not being displayed properly. Um, again, Microsoft says they're working on a resolution for these, uh, so we'll see when they come out. Something new this month that showed up on Windows Server 2022. Um, after you install the KB listed here, 5034129, which I put in parentheses here is from January. This was the, the Server 2022 issue from last month. There are some issues with Chromium-based browsers, such as Edge, of course, Microsoft's own browser. Um, they may not open properly or display properly with a white screen. Um, the issue has to do with the image files that they're ex executing and loading. And they do provide some detailed workarounds if you want to go in and tweak the registry to make it work properly. Uh, I didn't go into all the details here, but if you go to the KB article that's in the link up above, um, you can go and take a look at those. Again, um, you have to go through and adjust some of the registry settings and it'll work properly for you. 
uh, hopefully Microsoft will get this resolved pretty quickly because um, we've seen this pop up and we've had a lot of reports coming in through our support team as well as to what's going on with this particular issue. Moving on to Exchange Server, Chris talked about this in quite a bit of detail at the beginning there when he was going through this month's updates. Um, the big issue uh, that was resolved this month was that they've put the extended protection uh, to be enabled by default now. Um, I copied the, the link to the blog here, uh, provides a lot of details on that. Uh, that was the best source I found. Uh, again, this is from Microsoft's own Exchange Server uh, tech group, providing a lot of details on this particular issue, uh, resolving both the CVE 21.4.10, but also talking about how extended protection works across these. Interestingly enough, uh, as far as known issues go, this is the one thing that they called out. Basically, they said when you go through and enable all this, uh, when you're running the setup.exe, you get an error message that says Exchange Setup has been enabled. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of interesting, but they're calling it as a known issue. Uh, but just be aware of that. If it pops up when you're configuring, it appears that you have configured it properly. Chris also talked about the Microsoft Office apps. Um, basically, everything was rated as critical this month, everything that came out from Microsoft. Um, the update for the click to run versions of uh, Office, including the 365 apps, Office 2019, and the long term service channel 2021. They address six vulnerabilities. Uh, important about these are none of them know, are known to be exploited or publicly disclosed. Those are only in the operating systems that we talked about earlier. Um, these particular vulnerabilities can re result in remote code execution or an elevation of privilege. There are no reported issues around these. Uh, a lot of KB articles. Uh, especially on the uh, regular Office apps, uh, 2016 in particular. You can see there were individual updates for the different versions as well as for the Office suite. Um, six vulnerabilities, slight different. If you compare the numbers with the click to run, the vulnerabilities addressed are slightly different. Again, uh, no reported issues, but they are rated critical. So you wanna follow very closely with um, updates once you get the operating systems updated. Um, there were also some questions I saw earlier talking about the .NET framework uh, updates that have come out. Generally, when we're going through the lists and Chris and I talk about bulletins, we talk about the security updates that come along, but there were .NET framework updates that are coming out, that have come out, and we'll be including them today in our update to the content for our products, in case you're asking. Chris mentioned between the Patch Tuesdays and the activity that occurs there, this has been a crazy month. Um, a lot of updates across all third-party apps. Um, I've included a list here. We'll go through them here in just a second. Uh, one of the biggest updates that come out, as Chris mentioned, different vendors release on different uh, cadences, but um, Oracle released their Java updates. And of course, everybody who uses the, um, the free version of the, or of the uh, Java updates have also rolled out their updates as well. So you'll see here as we get into this, um, Azul Zulu, for example, is one of the other products that go through and use the Java updates. In this particular case, they've updated, uh, had four different updates. There are um, four versions of Java in the field now. So you'll see updates for version eight, which is obviously the oldest one. Uh, and these other ones are the long-term service uh, channels for these different Java updates. There's 11, 17, and 21, um, 21 being the most recent that came out. And um, so be aware that there are updates for Azul Zulu if you're using that. There are updates for the Java development kit itself. Again, there's version 21 here. You'll see six vulnerabilities, six vulnerabilities for version 17, um, and of course, eight and 11 as well. And then we know that a lot of people use um, Coretto as their Java update tool. And of course, they have their updates as well for version 21, 17, 11, and eight as well. Um, keep in mind that um, Oracle made a change in the way they've implemented Java. Way back in version eight, you can update both the runtime environment as well as the development kit. Um, moving forward with 11, 17, and 21, you have to actually compile the updates into your applications um, using the Java development kit only. There's no longer a runtime that's running there. So a little bit different in patching. It made life easier for us, but harder on the development side. At least we don't have to go through and update the runtime all the time. Chris mentioned about the various Chrome updates that are coming out. Basically, you can see these are coming out weekly. I put the dates on these. Here's the 16th, the 23rd, the 30th, and then February 6th. 
So we're getting regular Chrome updates with security fixes. So be aware of those. And of course, the other one dropped uh, yesterday late. So we have another one that's not even on this list. This is between the patch Tuesdays. We had Firefox, Firefox ESR, and Thunderbird updates in the middle of the month, which was nice on the 23rd. So those came out. We'll be waiting on another update here from them shortly, I'm sure, from our Mozilla group. We also saw updates for PDF Editor from Foxit and their consumer version of Reader as well. Um, Chris talked about the, um, the vulnerability that we've had in our VPN. Um, we did do we do support our own products from a patching perspective as well, and there was an update for the Pulse Secure VPN desktop client that we released here back on February second. Moving on to, from Windows to the Apple side of things, um, there were quite a few uh, software updates from Apple directly as well as third-party vendors on there as well. We did see Monterey addressing nine vulnerabilities. Uh, we saw Ventura. Uh, addressing 13 vulnerabilities. We saw a Safari, up, Safari update for Ventura and Monterey as well. So they're in the browser side. And finally, a Sonoma update that addressed 17 vulnerabilities as well. You know, it's pretty typical. Apple generally supports three versions of their operating system. Uh, usually the newest one will come out around the Thanksgiving holiday sometime around then uh, in November. And they will then drop support very quickly for the oldest one in this case. Um, that would be Monterey. So we'll see in the fall when the new one comes out. Um, of course, uh, Chrome updates as well. On top of the various Apple operating systems, we saw three different uh, releases throughout the month, this time between the patch Tuesdays. Um, we saw an update for Docker Desktop that addressed four vulnerabilities. Evernote addressed it one vulnerability. Um, Microsoft obviously supports updates on top of the Apple operating system as well. We saw this one particular vulnerability, 20677 here that came out the middle of the month. You'll see it. there was an update for Excel, OneNote, I think I listed a couple other here, OutNote, PowerPoint, and Word. So there, there was that update that came out uh, in the middle of the month, so be aware of that. And of course, a lot of people run the Edge browser on top of the Apple OS as well. And so we saw three different updates that came out for Edge uh, periodically throughout last month. So a lot of third-party releases, obviously, happening uh, you know, across a lot of different operating systems. And here is the Mozilla update as well for Firefox and Firefox ESR and Thunderbird, finally. So lots of activity this last month. As Chris mentioned, you know, in addition to your normal patch cycle that we're seeing for your typical Patch Tuesday and all the OS and uh, you know, application updates that come out from Microsoft, we're now seeing a lot of interim updates that people are running these days as well uh, as part of a regular patch cycle to catch the most important of those third-party updates. Um, so there was a lot of activity, so pay attention and kind of look through the information that we provided there. We have a lot of links for those of you who download our presentation to take you to the appropriate location to read more about those. With that, Chris, kind of where are we on the question side? All right. So, um... We do have a question from Elgin. Uh, did anyone encounter server rebooting again unexpectedly one to two weeks after January's .NET update uh, for server 2016 was deployed and rebooted? Uh, so uh, don't know if we heard any particular issues with that directly um, through our support channels, but usually with that, um, it's more of the Microsoft side. So you might, most people may be going directly there if anybody has a similar experience, go ahead and share that uh, real quick and we can share that on here. So that was more of just a, hey, did anybody have the same issue? The next one was from Matthew, question regarding the patches from December and, December and January. Sorry, those words are muddling in my mind as I was speaking. Was there anything that potentially broke print filter pipeline service.exe? Um, Todd, did, we didn't have anything specific for a known issue around that, right? I don't think so, but I did. We did go into print servers a little bit in more detail last month because there was an article mm -hmm. that came out about Microsoft going to update their entire, you know, the printing infrastructure. Right. And there, I, he mentions the tool in here. Um, I talked a little bit about that last month as well. Let me go back and see if I could find some of those links and I'll uh, provide them here. Yeah. So, Matthew, we'll, we'll see if we can dig up a little bit of the content we talked about last time. Microsoft is making 
big changes there, but it's more of a additive, not a complete restructure of what's currently there. So it's it sounded as Todd and I were researching it that it's going to be something that you move on to and replace kind of how printing currently works. But it's not like they're gutting and replacing and changing out everything underneath um, to, to do this. So um, I think they're making some good strides there, but I don't think it's relating to what you're probably running into. Uh, Curtis was saying he had an unexpected reboot last night. Uh, Matthew, question there, did Microsoft address the issues with January's security patch failing due to the lack of recovery partition? Um, so that one, uh, let's see, what did I, I, I just went into this yesterday with uh, one of the writers from Tech Target who was asking about that as well. Microsoft has a very complicated, unfortunately, um, challenge with how WinRE is updated. So if you're on the latest branches, Windows 11 and going forward, WinRE is gonna get managed by the OS level. If you're on anything older than that, there is literally, there was a separate URL getting into details about each of the other distro branch levels. Um, so with that, I think the unfortunate answer is Windows 11 and uh, later, great if it's anything older you're kind of stuck with trying to have to fix the issue directly um i've that's probably the the short answer to that the full answer of how do you go about that is very complex like i said there's uh, a lot of individual links for each different uh windows edition and branch level that vary on how to approach it so not good news there apologies for that uh, Matt had a question about subscribing to ESU. So a uh, quick quick update on that for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. Ivanti has been doing uh, ESU, what what's now called ESU support since all the way back to NT4 days. Uh, when I started with Shablik, uh, we actually were wrapping up extended support for NT4 um, as I was coming into to that team there. Um, crazy that I've been in the industry for that long now. Um, I've got a senior graduating this year. It's flying by. Uh, but uh, basically, there's kind of two parts to this. If you subscribe to Microsoft's ESU uh, coverage, um, they've now moved to the Azure Arc subscription model. Uh, so you can actually subscribe monthly through that. Uh, some of you are doing the, the more traditional ESU um, uh, MAK key model. Um, that's one where you have to kind of uh, ask. It's not on the menu, but you, if you ask and you ask hard enough, you can still get it from what we understand. Um, but that's kind of bottom line, Matt. You have to have that ESU subscription from Microsoft in one form or another to get access to turn on patching. The patches are actually public. You can go out and download it directly from Windows Catalog. You just can't run it on a 2012 server unless you either have the Azure Arc agent with an active subscription, turning that feature on, or you have an MAK key that enables the ability for patching to occur. That being said, if you're an Avanti patch customer, because we do have non-Avanti uh, 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 organizations on here as well, and we have those who are running on Microsoft and using our third-party catalog, whoever, you know, whatever products you're using on the Avanti side, we provide that content for people who are subscribing to Microsoft's ESU and want to continue your product, our, our, our product being able to support that like you've always done. It's a more of an operational subscription um, that you could subscribe to to make it so that our EPM product, our security controls product, our neurons patch product, uh, you can get that content directly in that experience. Again, requires the Microsoft ESU, but then you could subscribe to ours to, to get access to that content to make it part of uh, how you're managing those systems. So if you need more details on that, reach out to us and we'll be happy to uh, hook you up with a more detailed uh, breakdown of, of what's going on there. Um, I think we've got most questions addressed. A 
more came in. Since Exchange CU14 was just released, manual modifications have to be made if you do not update, right? Uh, we typically we do not install the CU at release. Uh, so yeah, Roddy, um, if you're not at it, again, each version CU is, is different for that. I think 2016 was CU23 turned on that um, uh, enhanced protection for authentication. And for 2019, it was CU14. If you're on the an older CU than that, Microsoft has details on there about how to turn on that feature. It's still in there um, for, I, I don't know how far back, but it's in there and there's um, details about how to turn that on. But you have to do that if you're on a CU level before they turned it on by default. So hit, hit up that CVE uh, page. If you scroll down, you're going to get to the FAQ section. They break it down by which edition you're on, tell you exactly which CU turned on the feature by default, and if you didn't, um, have links to more detail there. Yeah, this month's KB article that I included, Chris, as well, I read through it in quite a bit of detail. They they talk about going back and turning it on in 2016 and other places as well. So they go into yep. quite a bit of detail on how to enable it. Absolutely. Follow-up question about the Connect Secure technology? No, um, the the Avanti patch solutions and endpoint management solutions do not share a code base with the Connect Secure product base. Um, so completely separate code base. Um, all right, uh, you're welcome, Remy. We're always happy to try to share as much detail as possible to make everybody's lives easier. Uh, there's a lot obviously out there, so we don't have questions for everything under the sun, but we do our best. Um, infographic for this patch Tuesday. That all should be live, but let me double check it because they did make some updates to the website. You can actually see that we had some um, format updates and things too. So a lot of our, our content and things were updated and the website is getting some, you know, facelifts and things like that as well. But if you go to Avanti.com under resources, there's the patch Tuesday uh, sub page there. You'll have the February 14th um, patch Tuesday is updated. The infographic link is there and working along with links to the blog and the presentation and webinar recording will be up there later today. Uh, so that's the best place to get that is on that patch Tuesday page. Um, Chris, did you talk about the addendum associated with our ESU? I didn't, I can talk about I that. I did not quick. mention that. I, there was a I question kind of from the, okay, yeah. There was a ahead. question from Ulan here, so I'll I'll address that really quick for you, Ulan. So we have an addendum with our Server 2012 ESU content in that we obviously can't do the patching without you having a Microsoft Azure Arc enablement or a Mac key in place. So all the addendum does is confirm that you understand that you have to have that separate key from Microsoft in order for the patching to occur. We can provide the content and patch and enable them through our patch products, but the understanding of, through the addendum obviously is from the legal standpoint that we aren't directly providing Microsoft keys to you. You have to get them from Microsoft. That's all that addendum is all about. Hope that's clear. There was a question about a Python security update without CVEs. Chad, I'm assuming you're saying Python on Windows, or are you talking Python in general? Might have to get some more details on that. Um, I don't see any immediate news just by looking on the Python side. I mean, a lot of vendors will say this is a security update without providing specific CVEs they addressed. So that's probably the question, maybe. Yeah, I apologize. We don't have a good answer for you on that one. We'd probably have to get more details so we could uh, research that in, in more depth. All right. Oh, he's saying it was uh, on our, our slides earlier. Yeah, it's probably listed as a security without CVEs. That's why. Oh, I, I see what you're saying in the between the patch Tuesdays. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're right. It's probably there. Um, 
Okay, so that's actually a good point. We we can tackle that real quick because that's actually a, a good one here. So many third-party solutions, and I'll go back a couple of slides here to get to the slide that Chad is referring to. Thank you for clarifying that. That definitely got my brain in the right place for this. Um, so we, we tend to, um, that's the Apple-specific one. Here we go. Uh, no, it's still not it. Where's the general? We got a lot of slides. You got to go way back. There's a lot between the patch twos. There's a lot of between the patch. Okay, so security updates with CVEs. Um, these are updates uh, for vendors that do a continuous delivery model, like Google Chrome. If you go to Google Chrome and download Google Chrome, you're always going to get the latest Google Chrome. And when they update, the latest Google Chrome is what's now there. It's just Chrome.exe. Uh, it's a continuous delivery model. They basically kind of treat everything as a contiguous stream. From a defense in depth perspective, many years ago, we made the decision to kind of break this down into kind of three buckets, security updates with CVEs, security updates without CVEs, meaning for those continuous delivery products, version N might have a security vulnerability that it's resolved in it. Version N minus one didn't have any, but N minus two did have CVEs again. The state of machines near environment can vary significantly on some of these products. We treat it as a defense, defense in depth approach where if it's a continuous delivery model, the CVE or the security updates with no CVEs are one where the N release may not have any CVEs identified, but N minus one or X you know, beyond that has CVEs identified in it somewhere and could uh, uh, you know, be resolving those on your on your system. So it's more of a defense in depth approach there. The ones where you see non security updates, that's a clearly kind of defined stream where they have security kind of continuous release track, and then they may have a non security branch as well. Um, so those are ones where uh, it's not that defense in depth approach type uh, approach there. Um, so hopefully, Chad, that helps explain that. That means that the Python update here is in that continuous stream kind of uh, model, but the latest one that we added support for there was one that did not have CVEs directly against it, but somewhere in its past, that release stream does have CVEs. So you could be resolving many in there depending on what the state of the machine was in that case. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that one. But great question I, for anybody who's not used to how we structure this. That's why we do it that way. Chris, there were some questions in there around the KB in particular, 503-4441, that talks about the Windows recovery environment and yeah. what Microsoft has done. All I've seen um, is chat from like patchmanagement.org and others that said that Microsoft provided the instructions to manually update your partition. They're not going through and doing anything automatic. And apparently that's mm -hmm. all they're going to do. I haven't seen anything beyond that. Have you seen anything else, Chris? No, and and again, like I said, I, I talked with uh, Tom Willett uh, at Tech Target about this yesterday too, and he was asking if we had seen any updates around that as well. Uh, Windows 11 and forward is going to give more direct kind of Win RE um, update controls uh, with the older versions. You have to go through their manual steps to reconcile the the current issues depending on your circumstances. I know that. Um, Susan Bradley, uh, if you're familiar with Susan, she's one of our moderators on patchmanagement.org. She's also uh, one of the curators of content on Ask Woody. Um, she had a recording of kind of stepping through that. Um, I don't know if it's directly on Ask Woody or if it's on one of the other streams. She's very prevalent in that space. So if you know her, you know her work and how good it is. I would say check there and you may be able to get even a, a video of them stepping through it. But that's the best that we've seen and no indication right now that Microsoft is going to be doing anything additional past the Windows 11 and newer branch levels. All right. I think we have addressed uh, most questions here. Andre had a question for Azuzulu. Is there a way for us to incorporate their subscription-based patch updates? So, Andre, that's probably something that, um, you know, we will have to we'd have to take a look at to see if uh, how they handle that if it's significantly different or if it's basically the same stream just a matter of how you license it. Some vendors, if you're subscribing 
um, basically the same installer updates it. Um, you know, maybe there's just a detection difference or something like that. Um, in other cases, it is a completely separate uh, uh, installer and uh, packaging uh, that we'd have to uh, separately kind of support. Um, so maybe shoot us a, uh, a request uh, uh, for that and we can investigate it, see what we can do there. All right, on that note, we will go ahead and wrap up for this month. And uh, thank you for joining, sticking around for a couple minutes longer too to go through some of the questions and we will talk to you in March. Thanks everyone, see you next month. Thank you.